Now, next up, we're looking at the impetus for law reform. So this means the the sort of reasoning that could result in in law reform. So what is the what is the sort of trigger, the prompt behind uh, laws being changed or being introduced entirely or being removed entirely? So changing values, needs, morality and ethics. So a significant challenge, I suppose, for the legal system is how to keep pace with the changing needs of society. So the laws remain relevant. As time goes on, lots and lots of things change, so the laws have to change to reflect that, but that can be tricky to do. And so the law must be representative of society's values and it must adapt as those change. And there's actually also new forms of criminal activity new technologies that facilitate that kind of criminal activity and that can result in new laws being necessary as well. So, for example, if we think about artificial intelligence as a very current kind of example, there are people out there who want new laws around this kind of thing because of concerns over things like plagiarism. So, we know that the artificial intelligence systems are trained on other people's creations or other people's sort of information, that kind of thing. So it could be paintings if we're thinking about um, or, or illustrations or pictures of any sort when we think about the AI that generates images. And it can be books or research or anything like that for uh, AI that generates text. It all has to be trained on something and there are people out there who think new laws need to come into play so their intellectual property is protected. Now that is an example of how technology can really... Um, play a part in the need for law reform. Now, laws can change on an ongoing basis in response to political pressure as well from lobby and advocacy groups. That is one of the aims of lobby groups, as we saw earlier. They want to influence decision-making. So it's not just about new technologies, new criminal activity. It can be about things that have been a problem for a long time, but the lobby groups are finally getting through to the government and making that, that impact with those decision makers. So there are a bunch of law reform influences and we've got five that we're talking about today. So social influence. So that is pretty straightforward with society's values. You can probably tie every kind of example you can think of for an impetus for law reform, you can probably tie to society's values. We'll have a look at some examples shortly that will help illustrate that for you. Cultural influence. So we're in a multicultural society. There are lots of different backgrounds and beliefs and things like that to, to cater for. And, um, to recognize those that diversity and those differences, you may need to to make law reform um, wait, make changes for for the law. Moral influence. So this is about what we believe is right or wrong. Political influence. So the federal, state, and local government can all influence the laws passed. And economic influence. So this can be in response to economic circumstances. So we know that interest rates and inflation and things like that are really big at the moment with cost of living. It can also be laws that impact society economically. Um, so the, the laws in response to economic circumstances, that is kind of a reactive thing. Um, 
and this it can also be I guess proactive as well. Uh, lobby groups can consist of large multinational companies so you've got um, this economic idea is is really important to some groups who want law reform because they are in that business of needing to make profit. So let's have a look at a few examples from these different categories. First up, we've got equal pay for equal work, which in this case we could list as a social example. And so in 1972, the Australian Conciliation and Arbitration Commission granted women equal pay for, equal, for work of equal value to men. So previously, it was only when women did the exact same work as men um, rather than what, is, can, what was considered the equal value. So this was in response to lobbying from unions and the newly elected Labor government as well. And another example, the same-sex marriage um, legislation that changed back in 2017. So the Australian Parliament passed the Marriage Amendment Act and that was after a survey showed that 60% of Australians supported the law reform. Now we can see how things overlap. So we looked at those different impetuses for law reform and we said social was one that tends to apply to all sorts of different examples you can think of and there's also overlap as well so you could say that the politics made an impact in both this example and the previous one with equal pay for equal work you had lobbying from the government in this case you had the government um holding the survey um, so those things impact the this law reform as well now a different a couple of different examples we've got an economic one from the united states so the inflation reduction act 2022 was passed by the united states congress to dec decrease inflation so it lowers drug, healthcare, and energy costs and makes wealthy individuals and large corporations pay their fair share of tax. So that is um, something that's happened with law reform that was as a result of those that economic kind of situation with um, wanting to decrease inflation. A moral example, so voluntary assisted dying is something that is a gray area when it comes to whether it's right or wrong. You've got different opinions about that based on um, based on beliefs, whether it's religious or political or otherwise. So Queensland passed the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill in 2021, and those laws came into effect in 2023. So Queenslanders who are already dying now have the option to die on their terms and it's a moral issue because whether this voluntary assisted dying should be legalized is something that's contentious um, because some people believe it's right that people should have that choice and some people believe that that's morally wrong Okay, so the influence of lobby and advocacy groups and the media. So as we mentioned, a lobby group is that group that is organized together and it's attempting to um, influence the government to achieve a desired outcome. So special interest groups can include school associations, conservation groups, trade unions, business organizations, and political parties. So you've got a whole huge range there. And Australians have the right to discuss an issue or lobby their elected representatives at all three levels of government. So this means that we have the right to approach our 
local government member, our state government member, or our federal government member, um, or any other member for that matter, to um, to try and get our our voice heard with whatever we want to um, bring to their attention. Um, but when this is organized collectively, so instead of you just going um, individually to to that government member, uh, when it's organized collectively, that special interest group is becoming a lobby group. And this is bringing more power to that group. If they're banding together to create a lobby group, then that's going to put more pressure on decision makers because you've got more people power behind it, more voters who are who are showing what their beliefs are, more sort of um, power with with I guess the majority of, of people. And lobby groups and the media can influence public opinion on topics and that can lead to change in societal views. So something that we often hear about when it comes to the media is like agenda setting and framing. So they um, they put things on the agenda. The media is reporting on certain things to get them into the public eye, in, into our uh, minds, and so we're paying attention to them. And they frame those things in certain ways to shape our views on them. So um, those views can then form how we decide to vote, what we lobby for, what we believe. And then, of course, it all just keeps going down, down this system where that then can result in law reform. So an example is double jeopardy. So this is a defense that prevents someone who's been accused from being tried again on the same charges if they've already been acquitted or convicted. So in 2014, victim lobby groups successfully pressured the Queensland government to overhaul Queensland's double jeopardy laws in the wake of R. V. Carroll. So that was 41 years earlier. And so Queensland's laws changed so that someone who was previously found not guilty could be retried for that same crime if new evidence was found. So this was something that was deemed important because we've spoken a bit about this idea of of technological kind of changes. So as the Attorney General at the time pointed out, advances in technology, particularly things like DNA testing, means that new evidence may become available years after a trial. And so it would be an injustice if that was just ignored. Um, and that was why these laws were changed. So someone could be retried if new evidence is found. Now, there is a movie called Double Jeopardy as well that you can see on the screen. And I believe that that was based on this opposite idea where if you've already been convicted for something, then you can't be uh, convicted again for the same crime. So Queensland went against that idea because this recognition that new evidence can be found which can um, change what the result is, what the findings are. Another impetus for law reform is patterns of crimes and civil offences. So people expect that the government is going to maintain law and order. And in order to do that, one of the things they need to do is identify patterns of crime. And that is going to allow them to make laws, amend laws, um, and potentially repeal laws to uh, make sure that they have 
things in place to to cater to those changing patterns of crime. So there could be new harms or existing harms could be getting worse and they need to try to stop those things from happening. Now there are a range of different strategies and it can involve individuals, communities, businesses, non-government organizations and all levels of government as well and um, it can be influenced by an understanding of local crime and crime patterns. So key areas of law reform in Australia in recent years, things like domestic and family violence, medical negligence, juvenile crime and alcohol fueled violence. Technological advances, we've spoken about a lot already. So this can include technological advances that assist in the investigative process. So of course, technology can be useful. Like we saw that DNA idea where new technology can result in um, an evidence being found in helping with that investigative kind of process but it can also facilitate criminal activity. So you've got two different sides here with uh, one that's positive and one that's negative. So um, the, the law needs to be updated to minimise the opportunity for individuals to be exploited or harmed by technology. So an example of how technology can facilitate criminal activity if we think about something like cyber stalking, now this has been something that's been um, that's been, I guess, a thing for a long time, but um, or stalking, in fact, has been something that's been around for a long time because people could do that. It was a physical kind of thing that people could do in person, um, but then cyber stalking. Um, has meant that that idea of stalking has taken on lots of new forms. So you can have email, cyber stalking, internet, computer, lots of different uh, devices and platforms that we have that can be used um, for that instead of just that, that physical idea that it used to be. Okay, another question for you to have a look at. So five factors influence law reform. We looked at at the start when we were talking about the, uh, the impetus for law reform. Now, one of them was social influence, which has impacted same-sex marriage and equal pay for equal work. So choose one of the other four factors influencing law reform explain the factor and provide a real world example of how the factor has influenced law reform and it can be domestic or international. So remember we looked at the, uh, the idea of the American uh, legislation that they introduced for inflation and uh, we looked at the voluntary assisted dying laws in Queensland so if you can, try and think of something different that you may be aware of that relates to one of those other four factors aside from the social influence. Okay, continuing on with our impetus for law reform, we've also got increased transnational and organised crime. So what are these? So transnational crime is all serious criminal actions that involve more than one country and that involvement can be through the the planning of those criminal actions, the actual execution or just the impact. So we probably think of execution the most, so involved in that sense where they're actually carrying out those criminal actions, but it could just be the, the pre- kind of phase where they're just planning it or it could just be the impact that results. And organised crime, so criminal actions that powerful groups are going to plan, control and execute on a large scale. So lots of criminal activities are not limited to borders 
of a country or different states or towns. So often international crime organizations are going to operate for some kind of monetary gain, um, but some can be politically or religiously motivated as well. Um, and we sometimes term those terrorist organizations. And Australia collaborates with international agencies to try and work against transnational and organized crime. So if we have a look at an example as well, so we know that recent technological developments have resulted in um, in new kind of new kind of patterns of crime and new crimes in general. So with the internet and the ease that people can now move between countries because of uh, different sort of travel advancements that we've had, uh, there has been an increase in transnational and organized crime. So pirates' ability, ability to access modern equipment like powerboats and different weapons has caused an increase in piracy. Now, an example of a movie that you may be familiar with is Captain Phillips that has Tom Hanks in it. And this explored this idea of piracy where you've got a, a ship that is traveling between countries with cargo and it's been intercepted by pirates who are wanting to, to get money um, and they hold the, the crew hostage in their attempt to do that. So this is showing this idea of um, between different countries. So it involved America, but it also um, involved, I believe, Somalia was the country where the pirates in this movie were from. So that idea of it involving um, multiple, multiple countries. Now, significant events and current issues, of course, are going to result in changes to the law in many cases. So they can highlight a law that's not working well, or they can highlight the need for a new law entirely. And a couple of examples that many of us will be familiar with are the Port Arthur Massacre in 1996. So this caused a major shift in people's opinions around gun control. So that then resulted in law reform and all Australian states and territories banned automatic and semi-automatic rifles. And another example is September 11 terrorist attacks in the US in 2001. So before this event, Australia had no counterterrorism laws, but since then, more than 92 laws have been introduced. So a significant event can result in lots of different law reform uh, to try and prevent those events from happening again. <laughs> 